Hey folks, Randy Newberg here. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Hunt Talk Radio, uh, also known as Randy Newberg Unfiltered. And today I'm doing something really unique because all of you have heard me say how you need to become politically engaged. And this podcast today and then a follow-up podcast in a couple weeks will be the two governor candidates for the state of Montana. And I know some of you are going to say, well, that makes it a pretty Montana-centric discussion, and it will be to some degree. But my point is, we in the hunting world complain that our issues have been brought over in the political sphere. And we can uh, you've heard me say many times, we can no longer stand there in the bleachers and expect to score a touchdown. We have to get involved in the political game. So all of you who are listening to this, I know you have contacts to other media outlets. Maybe you own a media outlet. And if you do, no matter where you live, I would ask that you engage in the policy debates that are important to us, because the only thing worse than complaining is complaining and not doing anything about it. So, And before I introduce our guest today, I just want to get the advertising part of the podcast out of the way. I want to talk about the two companies that sponsor this podcast. The first one is Go Hunt. Uh, Those of you who've listened to this podcast and and read a lot of what I am writing out on our Hunt Talk forum or out on our Randy Newberg Hunter YouTube page, you know that I've become a really big fan of the insider service from Go Hunt. And if you go out there right now, uh, it's gohunt.com and click on the insider tab. Use the promo code HUNTTALK, H-U-N-T-T-A-L-K, And if you do that, you're going to get a free Gerber scalpel blade knife, their Vital Series knife. And I can assure you that if you use the insider service from Go Hunt, you are going to have so much information at at the tip of your fingers. You're going to spend a lot of time researching draw odds, units, states, application processes, anything that you need to help you improve your ability to draw tags you're going to get it with the Go Hunt Insider Service. So go there, gohunt.com, and use the promo code HUNTTALK. And the other great sponsor of this podcast and a lot of other things we do is Orion Coolers. And right now, in fact, every month, if you go out to our Facebook page, you're going to find some promos where we are giving away a 65-quart, super-duper, great Orion cooler. And... I don't use stuff just because someone asked me to. I first say, send it to me. I want to abuse it and see if it works. And the the coolers I have from Orion have had the abuse put to them. They work great. You can tell the way they're designed, how uh, sturdy they are, how well they keep your ice cold. I mean, it's uh, how frozen it is. It's, it is a really, really good cooler. Uh, I use them in super warm weather, and they stand up to most everything we do. But if if you're interested in being in the drawing for one of those Orion coolers, there's no cost, there's no charge. Uh, Go out to the Facebook page of Randy Newberg Hunter, and you're going to see some videos out there where we talk about what you have to do to enter the promo. And so far, we've given away two of them, uh, January and February, and we're going to be giving one away every month. Of the remainder of the year. So anyhow, with that, I'm going to introduce our guest today. He is a successful businessman from Bozeman, Montana, and he is a candidate for governor. And welcome, Greg Gianforte. Thanks, Randy. I'm pleased to be with you today. Yeah. And uh, it's by coincidence, I guess, that Greg and I live in the same town. And I drove over to his, his place here. And when you drive into someone's yard and you see deer antlers on their porch and you see a deer stand hanging in the backyard it's it you really kind of get the feel that maybe this guy does this stuff well it's a big part of why i'm here randy (laughs) (laughs) and like i was telling you before we got on air a lot of times when i do this whether it's for the tv show or or this podcast you talk to people and you kind of feel like uh they didn't quite understand the issues um, you and I spent about a half hour here walking around looking at your place and I didn't have that feeling that you were needing to be coached on this topic any, in any way. Is that, no. I, I fell in love with Montana 40 years ago and my, 
my first trip was up in the back country in the Absorkies with 18 ninth graders. And we spent the whole <laughs> summer up at Black Canyon Lake and Grasshopper Glacier. And, and uh, you know, I knew at that point that I was going to make a life here in Montana. My second trip, I hiked with a buddy of mine from Spotted Bear all the way to Lincoln, all the way across to Bob Marshall. Whoa. Uh, it was a 10-day hike. And, uh, and then, you know, my fate was sealed. Yeah. And it, it, since then, it's been no looking back. We've raised our four kids here, and uh, that's probably, for me, that was the biggest joy is being in the outdoors with my kids, especially when I, they got old enough they could hunt with me. Yeah. And uh, we've had a lot of adventures. Yeah. So a lot of people have heard my story about how I got into hunting. Mm -hmm. How I mean, is this something that was part of your family all along? It yeah. wasn't. I grew up uh, fishing, but not hunting. Okay. Uh, and I started hunting uh, a little over 20 years ago. And okay. it, I have to be honest, it's become my obsession. Uh, it's what I do. <laughs> I uh, see that based I, on what you have here. Well, as we said, even, you know, even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. <laughs> but I had, we had a, uh, I love being in the outdoors. I think we, uh, I, I mentioned to you, we had, we have house guests and we, we entertain a lot. Our homes like Grand Central Station a little bit. Yeah. We, uh, last spring I had a guest out and I looked in the freezer. He wanted some game meat and. I found eight eight species in the freezer, so that, that was an indication that we had done it. Even when we took our company public here, I mean, we I had a so, I'm in the software business, and right. we took our company public. And even when we had all the investment bankers from New York and San Francisco came to Montana, I show them a little Montana hospitality. I had them to the house for dinner, and yeah. and uh, of course, if you're coming here, you're probably going to get game meat for dinner. So I made an elk tenderloin, and I had antelope chops wrapped in bacon. And, and that was the year I'd been able to get a lion. So I made a, a, a mountain lion teriyaki. Uh -huh. And the, the Scott from Morgan Stanley said uh, in his accent, you know, did you shoot any of this? And I said, <laughs> well, everything but the bacon. <laughs> oh. Well, I guess that... Uh... That, that's probably as good of a credibility statement as you could could open up with, there, Greg. Um, but your family, your your kids, you, you raised them in the hunting, fishing lifestyle. We did, and I think the best thing I ever did in my working career was I took uh, I took Fridays off in July and August, rather than taking one two week period sometime during the year. I took Fridays off, so that gave us eight consecutive three day weekends. Great. And so we'd head out on Friday morning, my wife and our four kids, and hit a trailhead someplace and backpack up into some alpine lake. And we'd base camp at the lake and then summit a peak on Saturday and come back to base camp and then come out on Sunday. We did that three to five times a summer uh, the whole time we're raising our kids. There are no cell phones. There's no TVs. Yeah. And it was just great to be out there. Yeah. So are your kids gone now? I mean, are they? My, gone? our kids are 26 to 20. Okay. So uh, we had one uh, uh, who's still with us at home. He's working for a tech firm in Bozeman. We've one out in Seattle. Uh, I have a third son that just rode his unicycle from Banff to Mexico. <laughs> and he just left this week to start an acting career in Chicago. And then my okay. daughter is a sophomore in college. Okay. So did you go through the same thing I did when my son went off to college? I only had one. So according to most people, if you only have one, you're really not a parent. Because <laughs> you, you know you're going to blame the right child. They're not going to fight with each other. But anyhow, when, when my son went off to college, I thought my wife was going to be the one who struggled with her, her child not being there. I was like a lost dog. I, I, my hunting partner was gone. Yeah. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this is... This is not going to work. And I I went through that. My my we have three boys and a girl, and so she was the last one at home, and she okay. was my she was my trapping partner. We ran a trap line together, trapping a beaver on the East Gallatin here, and muskrats and raccoons and things. And, yeah, and then all of a sudden she like turned into a young lady. <laughs> it's like, okay, well, <laughs> who's going me? hunting with me? Yeah. <laughs> Well, my, my wife threatened to rent me a teenager for hunting season. She said, if you don't quit moping around the house, I'm just going to rent you a teenager. But well, anyhow, I, that's all good background for, for the listeners out here. And, and now I, I'd sent you a list of questions, mm -hmm. uh, that are, are important to our audience. Um, 
And everyone who listens to my podcast knows that Randy Newberg, as much as he might be a conservative guy, he mostly is uh, attached to the party of the hunting, fishing, and public land crowd. And a lot of these questions are... As, as you saw, they're, they're pretty centric to that topic. So, mm-hmm. And uh, you can take them wherever you want. They're, they're, that's the beauty of podcasts. There's no boundaries here. So, um, <clears throat> But for me, the, I look at the, the trends in hunting. The National Shooting Sports Foundation did their studies in 2008, eight nine, and I think they did one in 10, 2010. And those studies show that the number one reason that people quit hunting, the number one reason people hunt less, and the number one reason they come from a hunting family but fail to get into hunting is lack of accessible lands to go and hunt. And their studies also show that 70% of hunters in the West use public lands as their primary place for, for their hunting. And so... I'm sitting here in your office, and <laughs> I'm looking at Gallatin National Forest out here, uh, out the window. And recently, there's been a lot made of, you know, we need to sell the public lands. Uh, the Mountain States Legal Foundation, a bunch of very sharp minds in, in Denver, uh, they recently came out with their their proposal that, you know, we should just sell the public lands. That's, that's where we're at at this point. And so I, I guess I'll, I'll leave it up open to you you have any thoughts opinions ideas on this idea that we we should sell public land well i i would not support any proposal that jeopardized um the access to public lands and i would not support a proposal that would include uh selling public lands Uh, it's a rich part of our history i understand i enjoy i spend a lot of time i mean i i remember the times uh, you know, going on horseback up into the Absorkies to find a mountain goat. And, and yeah. it's just, it's part of what we have. Uh, I do, I do think our federal government has not done a particularly good job of managing our federal lands. Uh, they're, yeah. they've turned into tinder boxes. We burn them every summer. And, uh, if we actually managed our public lands, we'd have more wildlife. Uh, there'd be more hunting opportunities. Uh, we'd also have more livelihoods because our, our, timber industry is getting strangled. So I am a fan of uh, increased state management that continues to be federally deeded. That is, it continues to be held by the federal government. But our federal government has not held up their end of the bargain in managing our national forests. I mean, wilderness is kind of off the, you know, that's kind of off the thing. No one's talking about selling wilderness. Right. We're talking about national forests that um, are just tinder boxes and Ready to, and they burn every summer. Yeah. So <clears throat> with that, the you, you brought up something that it, it, we, we introduced you as being a business person here is, and I would say you're probably one of the more respected business people in the Rockies with what you built here and, and the company. Um, and I'm, I'm a CPA, and I see this with a lot of my other businesses. Did you feel that... <clears throat> having an abundance of public lands was a detriment, a benefit to being oh. a business in the Rockies? Oh, it adds to the quality of life. I mean, it's just the uh, the benefit of a small town Rocky Mountain community like Bozeman or many other communities in right. Montana is that there's no commute. I mean, yeah. and and I you look you wake up every day and look at God's creation outside, the incredible peaks and and it's inspirational. Yeah. I think it, it it adds a quality of life that's unsurpassed. You can you can put in a day. We know in the summer times, you know the the sun's up till ten o'clock at night, and you can yeah. beat it out of work at five if you can <laughs> get out of the office, and you can be up in the hills yeah. uh, or up in the early morning. So it's a quality of life issue. Uh, it's also a, a way of life. This uh, uh, as as hunters know. I mean, there's deep deep satisfaction in spending time out there. Whether you whether they end up putting something in the freezer or not. Um, there's a, a connection with the land that can't be, there's a deep part of your soul that can't be touched in any other way except being out there. Yeah. And for, for me in a CPA world and a lot of my clients, it almost seemed like that was a, a competitive advantage in recruiting talent. I, I look at some of the talent that lives in the inner mountain West and I'm not just talking about Bozeman. It could be Logan. It could be Flagstaff. It could be wherever. There's some super qualified uh, intelligent, 
amazing people that come there and they take huge pay cuts from Chicago or New York or San Francisco or wherever. Yeah. And, I, and, and do you think that's... Well, the, I, I don't think people should have to come here and take a pay cut. I, 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 I like that idea. <laughs> well, that's what we... That, that was my whole proposition. When we moved here, we had this idea that you could cl- create a global business in a rural state like Montana. And everyone told us it was impossible. Yeah. And we started in this house, my wife and I, and I had a blank sheet of paper and a pen. And uh, we created uh, a business that had 1,100 employees with an average wage that was a national wage. Average wage was almost $90,000 a year here in Bozeman. Wow. And that created, and ultimately that started an economic engine that created 40% of all the wage growth in the whole state occurred in the Bozeman area in 2014. Mm-hmm. And I'm very proud that, that I had a hand in actually making that happen. Yeah. But I don't think we have to, we don't have to attempt to eat the scenery. If we can, if we can actually, you can bring, I mean, this, the internet changes the rules. We, you can, you can live in a beautiful place like this. You can do work for a national firm or start your own firm and uh, bring down a national salary and still be minutes away from white water, rock climbing, great hunting op- op- opportunities and world-class trout streams. Yeah. Well, that's, it's good to hear you say that uh, the public lands are, are not, we, we won't eat the scenery. As, as you called it. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to get on to the next question. And, and it was a little bit into what you, you just touched on in that answer is it, rather than, than sell the public lands, there's a lot of people who have been advocating that transferring the public lands is a big issue. And in the last legislative session here in Montana, we had, I think, almost 20 bills related to that across the West, a lot of the state legislatures had similar bills. And for some perspective for our listeners, uh, very often they say, well, what's the difference? And I grew up in Northern Minnesota and our state lands, there were no restrictions on access. They got managed quite well. So from their standpoint, it's like, who cares if it's federal or state? And then we get to the West and we, each state has a constitutional mandate that these state trust lands have to make money for the schools. And each state has different rules. Like in Colorado, you can't hunt on state trust lands. New Mexico, Wyoming, you can't camp on state trust lands. So throughout the West, we've been seeing a lot more opposition to the idea of what's called state transfer uh, of these federal lands that currently we have a lot of access to these federal lands. And you touched on it, and and I'm not going to hold federal land management up as, here's the example of how to manage land. Unless you want a big barbecue every (laughs) summer, which is what we've been getting. So with with that said, um, and in 2014, the, the Republican Party had one of its platform planks is the transfer of state lands. Um, And I, I guess that brings me to the question of, does Greg have an opinion on the transfer of federal lands to the states? Yeah, I, I don't support deed transfer of lands. What I do support is increased state management of the forests that are in the state here. Because they're, the reality is the federal government's not holding up their end. As I mentioned, they're tinder boxes. They burn every summer. We, we burn way more trees than get harvested. And honestly, if we... No one's suggesting we go back to clear cutting. That's like those days are gone. Yeah. But by thinning forests, you get more undergrowth. There's more wildlife. It would actually increase hunting opportunities. And and honestly, anybody that's hiked in the national forests in the West knows that many of those, these have become devoid of wildlife because the, the cover is so thick that there's no grass. Yeah. There's nothing to eat. Uh, and as a consequence, it's it's pushed the, our elk herds and our deer herds down onto private property or in the valleys, and it's actually constricted hunting opportunities. Yeah. And I, I, I often say that, that if we focused on better management of our federal lands, we wouldn't have what some call harboring or whatever of elk necessarily running to the private lands. Well, the reason that the elk run to the private lands is there's usually better food. There's uh, just better habitat for them. Right. So you're... Your point there, I, I don't think too many hunters are going to argue that And there's point. a there's a concern. Is the state ready to take on this responsibility because there's so much federal lands? That's why I'm a proponent of some pilot projects. I, I played football in high school. We had a championship team. And the way we won games was running three- to five-yard plays. 
And we got to make sure that the state can absorb this responsibility. So there's been proposals floated here in Montana that would involve the federal government contracting with local state municipal organizations like uh, the uh, commissioners in a given county uh, for a portion of the forest to let's try some pilots. I mean, it, what we're doing right now is not working. Uh, we ought to try some new things. And I'd, I'd be a fan of that. Yeah. And that's uh, everyone listening to this podcast is like thinking, well, Randy, you told me this, you told me that you, you've always advocated this, advocated that. And, and I'm really interested to hear the positions that you have and, and the, what the, our, our future guests, your opponent will have, because w- one thing I think we as hunters are guilty of is we think that once every four years, we make a statement about our issue, and that's when we go to the ballot box. And we have a tendency to withdraw from the process of policy and, and policy making for the other mm-hmm. however many, four years minus one day. Um, and w- when you bring up ideas about, hey, we should try something new, we should try this, maybe experiment with that, I don't think anyone is, is going to be a opposed to experimenting and thinking about things in a different way. Mm -hmm. One of the struggles that we always get in is it seems like it's got to be one side or the, 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 it's, it's always an either or proposition. Yeah. And I don't know. Do you, do you, my personal observation is I hate the either or proposition because it doesn't allow for creativity. Yeah. We, we, we just need to get concerned parties, sit down around the table. And, and honestly, Randy, I have to be honest. There are, um, there are some people who are not acting in good faith. They've taken ideal, ideological position and there is no negotiation. Right. And, and honestly, at the point, uh, if you take an intractable position, then it's kind of hard to even have a conversation. But right. let's get the stakeholders around the table. And there's multiple parties. There's the those in the state at FWP that are trying to do the science. I think they could do a better job at science. Um, we have the sportsmen. And in Montana, an awful lot of the wildlife's on private land as well. They have to be at the table. And, and we have to have a society that respects private property rights as well. Right. So they need a voice. But I think reasonable people can sit down. And, and one of the things I've been very clear on as I've been out visiting with folks is I, I'm not a big one for calling people names and using labels because these issues are not left or right issues. They're just issues. (laughs) (laughs) We ought to be able to sit down and talk about them. Uh, I'm sure some listeners are like, Randy, did you coach him on that? Because that's what you always say. They're not left or right issues. And I agree, Uh, Greg, they're they're not. These are American issues or Montana issues or they really are not that what we but want to make to be really clear i would oppose any plan that jeopardizes keeping public lands public okay great that's that's as concise as of an answer as i could ask for so then i'm i'm gonna talk about one that i'm sure you if you're like me you'll have a lot of thoughts on this and governor mead in wyoming he has been very engaged in endangered species discussions through his Mm -hmm. role in the Western Governors Association. And I've been listening to a lot of what he's been saying, and it's really common sense stuff. It's not, oh, we need to, you know, like some people say, I would get a jerk the tax code out by its roots. He's not saying that. I think he's looking at the bigger landscape and saying, can we have federal legislation designed for single species management, whether it's grizzly bears or wolves or the snail darter, or it almost was sage Sage grouse, grouse, um, clover, right? All all that stuff. And, and name your favorite furry little (laughs) animal. (laughs) Right. And so I've, I've listened to what he's been doing and I've been watching it and his leadership on sage grouse was, was very good. Um, Mm -hmm. And so as a governor, would you see yourself trying to be a spokesperson and leader on some of these maybe national type policies that really affect the West? You know, if they, if they're directly affecting Montana, I would be, I mean, that's my first commitment is to the people of Montana. I've had a chance to sit down with Matt Mead. I've met with Butch Otter in Idaho. I've met with Doug Ducey and a a number, about 20 of the sitting governors across the country. And I think that there is a common theme here, whether it's the endangered species act or the clean power plan or EPA rulings, there is a general sense that the 
federal government's like way outside the box. They're mm-hmm. constricting our economies. They're extingu- extinguishing livelihoods. Uh, they're removing our property rights. Uh, Waters of the U.S. is another example. And I think by working together with the other governors who have common interests in uh, protecting uh, the opportunities within the state and also balancing it with uh, an economy that allows people to live there, uh, I think better decisions are made locally than they are being dictated by some bureaucrat back in Washington. Uh, so, And I, I think there's been some uh, – I, I appreciate the leadership that uh, Matt Mead has taken in Wyoming. I, I think our own attorney general here in the state has taken a real leadership against some of this EPA overreach that we've seen. Um, and I think there's more we could have done. Uh, our, our current governor really has not stood up and taken a hard position on any of this stuff. And as a consequence, I just don't think Montana's interests are being – represented the way they should be Hmm. Uh, and i you know i take that also this uh this last year i'm in favor of you know if the science supports additional hunting opportunities uh, we ought to be encouraging that Uh, we have elk herds that are way over target quotas in many regions in montana and yet our house saw the wiz our our state house saw the wisdom in passing a bill that would have extended our shoulder season hunts the Senate passed it, both the House and the Senate, right. but our current governor vetoed it. Right. And I think that was a bad decision. So let's get into elk management then. <laughs> That's a good segue to the next. Even though those questions were later down the, the list. Um, I, and sitting on the board of the elk, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, I don't know if all of our board members get as many emails as I do, but I get tons of emails and phone calls. And it's fa- not my fault, Randy. <laughs> I was walking out the door and my wife hands me a note. Here, somebody called, they had an elk question for you. I'm like, oh, great. But my point for bringing that up is that in the process of being on a national board, I get to see how a lot of other states do their elk management and their processes for doing it. Mm-hmm. And, and I'll use an example of Wyoming and just because they're close to us and they they have a similar property ownership that we do as the further if you start from east and move west it transitions from predominantly private ground to predominantly public ground by the time you get to the western border Um, they have a remarkable elk management strategy there they they don't end up in nearly the amount of harangue and arguing and fighting and energy wasting as we do in montana and I've been watching this go on in Montana for a long time. So to your point of the, the, the shoulder seasons, which for our, our listeners, what shoulder seasons are, it's a season that is either prior to your general season or after your general season. So if you can kind of think of it on each side, it's called the shoulder season. Um, our elk management plan was started in 2002 and three. I think the legislature adopted it in 2005. I might, I might be off by one session here, um, but I, as a business person, if my most valuable asset, and I will argue that of terrestrial species, elk is our most valuable species in Montana, both economically to our department, to a lot of our, our businesses, and culturally it's probably our most valuable wildlife asset. I I can't imagine running a business when your most valuable asset is uh, governed by a plan that's 12 years old. I think we need to revisit it. (laughs) And And I would also say that, and this is a chronic problem, I think, at the state. With the current leadership we have, we've been appointing government insiders to the heads of agencies. And one of the things I believe is we need to get people in charge of these agencies who are not driven by ideology, but have driven by common sense, the ability to bring stakeholders around. And Fish, Wildlife, and Parks in the state of Montana is at war with landowners, and they're at war with sportsmen as well. They've pissed everybody off. Uh, we, I was talking to a farmer, a rancher here north of Bozeman recently, and he's got a 1,000 head of elk on his property eating his haystacks. The herd is way over carrying capacity of the forest. So they're coming down. I mean, they're hungry, right? They come down and they eat his haystacks. He doesn't want them eating the haystacks, and yet there's no way to actually use management practices to, to increase the hunt pressure. 
it seems like the only predator we manage anymore is man. Um, <laughs> and, and that's a problem. I think we need, we need new leadership at FWP here in the state that's willing to bring the stakeholders around the table and have some common sense discussions. Uh, we had a number of comments from officials in fish, wildlife, and parks here just recently that they somehow think shoulder season hunts are unethical. But yet the herds are way over the carrying capacity of the forest and they're damaging private property. And so we ought to be able to sort through this stuff because uh, we have common interests. Mm. I think it's better as possible. Yeah. And one of the things I've noticed is that in these other states that I'm familiar with and get a lot of phone calls from is and they have different periodic reviews of their elk management strategies, conservation plans. They have different terms for all of them. But if they, if there's a commonality to all of them, however frequent it is every five years, every seven years, every 10 years, they bring all their stakeholders together. Mm -hmm. And all the ones you mentioned, the landowners, the outfitters, the hunters, the everybody who's, who's needs to be at the table. And they agree, this isn't going to be perfect. Nobody's going to get everything they want. But when we leave here, this is how we're going to manage. Mm -hmm. And then they revisit it in five years or seven years. And they don't invest nearly the amount of energy fighting about elk as we do in Montana. And so when, when you talk about bringing the stakeholders to the table, I think a lot of Montana listeners would say it, it's time for the for that elk management plan to be looked at and, and the objectives, um, you know, some, and this is where the stakeholder process is so important. And I don't care if you live in Montana or wherever, if you aren't at the table to voice your input to it, don't expect your voice to be heard. And, and a lot of people, I'll say this as a hunter who was involved in our current elk management plan, not a lot of hunters showed up. So we, and now I hear people say, well, the objectives are too low. Uh, this or that well well part we're, of that we're, randy we're, i would just say and you've been involved in the process a long time but i've also heard from people that when they show up their comments aren't listened to and it's not reflected in the plan and it doesn't encourage them to come back the next time and that's a very very common question or common comment people say well this was a formality i they by law have to take public comment and so they can check that off their box you hope that's not the case. You mm -hmm. hope that it's management for what's best for the resource. Yeah, it's a resource that should be available for viewing and hunting and for the health of the herd. There's a stewardship responsibility here. It just seems like we've elevated wildlife above livelihoods here in the state and even above some hunting access. Uh, so I just I just think we can do a lot better if we brought a brought a more balanced common sense approach to it. Great. All right, man. You you know usually we get into long dissertations about all kinds of stories and stuff, Greg. So we're plowing through these questions. I'm I'm worried we're going to run out of things to talk about. Well, You'll we just should just go back and talk and tell some hunting stories. I, I was going to say you're just going to have to tell hunting stories. But <laughs> before we uh, we got on air, uh, Greg was telling me the story about. He was sitting in his deer stand over here by the river, which I can vouch for the fact that he's got a deer stand out here. Um, and uh, you said a black bear. It's the black bear you have here in it's, the house. Yeah, the, yeah. It it was uh, so this black bear. I was I had a whitetail tag, but here comes this black bear, and I had my bow. I was in the tree stand, and I had a bear tag too. So <laughs> he comes right on the stand. He's only fifteen feet away. So I released an arrow, and uh, I thought the shot was good, but I wasn't sure. And, he, he flipped end to end real quick, and then, shocking to me, he climbed the tree next to me. <laughs> and he's about, I'm up 15 feet, he's up 15 feet, we're like eyeball to eyeball. And I'm thinking, hmm. So I go to get another arrow, and I had, I had, I had shot a whitetail earlier, so I only had one arrow left, and the knock was broken, and I didn't have a handgun. And I'm hoping that first shot was good. And I'm sitting there just as quiet as a church mouse, and he's looking back at the spot because the arrow's sticking in the ground. It went through him and stuck in the ground. And he's looking down there. And then I, it seemed like an hour and a half. It was probably 90 seconds. But he came, climbed down and then wandered off about 20 yards and expired. And the, this, is, this is the cool part about Mount Montana, Randy, because I waited about a half hour. And I got down, went in, got my uh, 
20 gauge, put a slug in it, came out just to make sure, you know. Yeah. And he was expired, so I was able to get some pictures, field dress him, uh, drop him off at the butcher, and uh, and uh, come home, shower, and I still made a 10 o'clock appointment at the office. <laughs> Uh, we, we maybe shouldn't tell those kind of stories, Greg, because there's going to be all these people living in urban areas who are going to be looking at real estate listings in Bozeman, Montana, or, or other intermountain communities. Well, you know, West. one thing, Randy, I, we spent, I mean, we grew up a, a big business here. We had, we were the largest commercial employer in Bozeman. Right. And I spent 15 years recruiting people here. And you know what I found? Really, the only cohort that we were very successful in hiring out of was Montanans who had moved away. And mm. at the end of the day, that's the issue we face as Montana, because as you mentioned earlier, we're, we're 49th in the country in wages. And for decades, we've been exporting our kids. We've shown that we can create a viable business here and people can prosper. And at the end of the day, that's why I'm running for governor, because I feel that uh, I, I'd like to have my four kids around the dinner table on Sunday afternoon. I think a lot of Montana parents feel the same. And yet we've been, yeah, Randy has his hand up. <laughs> and I don't, I don't want to have to get on an airplane to go see my grandkids' ball games and recitals and things. And yeah. So well, that's one of the things I've committed, that when I'm governor, we'll wage an all-out campaign to bring our kids home. Because it can happen now. And, but we, we do need to manage our forests. We need to be responsible about resource development. And we got to look at some new things like high technology and telecommuting and there's some other methods. It's kind of an all above approach, but I philosophically, I believe that jobs and opportunities are only created in the private sector. They're not created by government programs. And uh, the size of our government's just exploded. It's grown 20% just in the last three years. And, and that's money coming out of every Montanan's checkbook and i think we're better off putting some of it back in their pockets they'd know what to do with it yeah. well i i got some more guns i need to buy <laughs> <laughs> never enough guns <laughs> uh, well back to your point about <clears throat> agencies um it used to be and this is not just montana most listeners if they were to go to their state's uh legislative history they probably had a structure back in the 1970s where their director of their agency was reportable and accountable to their commissioners, that it was not a legislative appointment, it was not a governor appointment. And this is my own observation since being involved in this stuff for 25 years now that the, you see a trend of the issues of hunting, fishing, public lands and access being brought more into the, the world of policy, whether it's legislative or otherwise. Um, and so I'm just trying to think, ha has that uh, changed where now directors are the appointment by the governor? Has that played a part in this process of now all this stuff becomes very political um, it sways one way or the other, and the pendulum is never really in the middle. It's always far right, far left, moving back and forth. Do you have any thoughts about how you would maybe change something so that agencies became more accountable? Or, or more Well, accountable? ultimately, the ultimate accountability is you get to elect your public officials. Uh, I think even if you put a commission in place, you know, generally those commissioners are appointed by the governor. So you end up having a longer tail on any kind of influence that occurs there. So I'm not sure that's the solution. In my experience in business, it's always been first who, then what. Jim Collins said that. You gotta, you gotta get the leadership right, and then a lot of other stuff kind of falls in the line. The other thing I've seen in a lot of state agencies, and I think it's true at FWP as well, many of these agencies have adopted a culture of enforcement rather than customer service. And that's what we did in our business. I, actually, our software business, we helped large multinational corporations, consumer businesses like Remington and Beretta Firearms and Columbia Sportswear and Travelocity and Expedia and Orbitz were all our clients. And we helped them with technology and services to embrace a culture of customer service so they could be differentiated. And boy, there's some big opportunities in state government to bring customer service back to the equation. Um, and... But it always starts with leadership. Yeah. I think that's where, and the specific structure, you know, I'm always happy to look at new ideas. I don't have strong feelings about that. Uh, but I do think uh, 
we need to get leadership right first. And we've been appointing government insiders who honestly are more of environmental extremists. They're not necessarily hunters. You saw the comments from FWP here just recently, somehow calling shoulder seasons unethical. I don't, I don't get that. We have herd, elk herds that are way over quota. We ought to be working to manage them and in the process create more hunting opportunities for Montanans. I think that's just common sense. And to think somehow uh, hunting in January is unethical, I, I just don't get that. Yeah. All tastes the same to you. <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> so here, here's a harder question. Um, and this is just somebody who's been in Helena every other year. Uh, we have a, a biannual legislative session. Some of our neighboring states and other states or listeners are, they probably have a annual or, or boy, can you imagine your legislature being in session year round? Oh, that would be because here the, the story always goes in Montana that we meet for 90 days every two years and we wish it was they met for two days every 90 years, but uh, <laughs> that's not quite how it works. But um, a lot of people in the hunting and fishing community look at positions that have been brought forth in the legislature where last legislative session, we had over a hundred bills that were related to hunting and fishing. Uh, and it seems like the mechanism of choice now to try implement any change becomes one side hammering the other, um, a lot of bills being brought forth on, on the legislative front rather than trying to manage it through agencies and through science and input because uh, I would opine that most of the legislators are not biologists. Um, they, I think I'm a biologist at times, but I, I don't think I'm any more of a biologist than they are or they more than me. So... In Montana, a lot of that legislation has been introduced by Republicans. Um, a lot of the time I spend up there is arguing against bills brought by Republicans. And we're talking about a guy, Randy Newberg, who, you know, in my other life, I'm a CPA. I just spent last weekend trying to disinherit the federal treasury as best as I could. Um, I, I have, you know, life member then, or I've got all the conservative credentials anyone would want. But it's at times frustrating to see how many of these bills are coming from way over on the Republican side. And some people would, would say, how could Greg as a Republican governor stop or, or be the, the voice of common sense when his, his party is the group that is bringing a lot of that? Well, I think we've had too much divisiveness. And you've seen that. You've experienced it. It's occurred within each party and across parties. And it's part of the reason why I've, I've just stopped using labels altogether. Because yeah. um, I think you, you use a label, no matter what label you pick, liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican, it's a pejorative to the other half of the people you're talking to. And, it, and it's immediately divisive. Yeah. So I just won't use them. Uh, I think that it's important. And it's, I, true leadership involves understanding what the key principle is in a given situation. I mean, we, we want healthy uh, wildlife herds. We want robust hunting access. And we need to respect property, personal property rights. You know, we have, a, we have a heritage and a legacy in public lands. Uh, we need to preserve that. Uh, and we need to make sure people have access to that land. Those are the principles. Okay, now, what bill was it you wanted to pass? <laughs> right? I mean, so if you can't Great. get that common ground, it's like whether you go to education or tax policy or any of these things, the problem is we get, we get into the weeds really fast and it gets emotional. And I think somebody, true leadership is about just putting the brakes on, backing up and saying, let's look at the big picture here. And uh, I think then a lot of this other stuff becomes clearer. Yeah. I, I've wrestled with some big problems in my professional <laughs> career. I mean, when we came here, people said, you can't start a global technology business here. And they gave us the reasons why they listed them, you yeah. know, and my wife and I, we just started it and we did it anyway. Yeah. So I love when people tell me things are impossible because <laughs> it just gets me fired up. That's, uh, that's the electrical engineer in me. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's refreshing for people to hear that someone says it's the policy first. It's, yeah. it, and, it's the principle. And I, it's, and I, yeah. And I know the key thing on a lot of people's mind is access, you know. Right, it and is. And here we're living just north of Bozeman. I think we have the loca lo 
closest re- fishing access to downtown Bozeman is on our property. And, uh, you know, I'm a big supporter of these stream access laws because uh, yeah. I enjoy them myself. Yeah. And we welcome people on our property. Okay. Uh, and the vast, vast majority are respectful and they yeah. follow the law because they want to enjoy the resource. Yeah. And, and, and it's gl- I'm glad that you brought that up because one of the things that makes, uh, and again, this is bragging about what I love about Montana, but a lot of other states have a similar law that as long as you stay within the high water mark of a navigable stream, you can fish it. Some other states have it where you sometimes you can't even float it, or even if you can float it, you certainly better stay in the boat and not climb out of out of there. And I look at a lot of these states that have a pretty good stream access law, like Montana's is often held up as, as you mentioned, a great stream access law. Economically, it's been great for us here in this state. Mm-hmm. And I go to other places where it's also great for their economies. The, the, the fishing yeah, if you're going to be out floating with a day it's nice to be able to pull up on a gravel bar and have lunch you know mm-hmm. or or wade up or downstream from a, a bridge it's it, it and if you're you know you learn if you've done any fishing in montana you know the the further you get from the road the better the fishing gets right? or in so, the hunting and the hunting <laughs> right exactly so uh you know no pain no gain but yeah. uh but we can do that within the yeah. law and uh I think uh, by the vast majority of landowners are very supportive. Yeah. Well, and that's good to hear because I, it, you can't talk about policy in Montana without people saying, well, where is this person or that person on stream access? Mm-hmm. And I think I just heard you say that you're good with our stream access. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we probably in the summertime, we have three to five cars parked on our property every single day. Fishing. Uh, fishing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as we say this, folks, we're sitting here looking out Greg's office window and the Gallatin, East Gallatin River is floating by here. I um, know almost every fish by name back there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wow, we're, <clears throat> we're covering some ground here. I should have probably been a, a little more detailed or, or had a lot more questions for us. Um, so I, I told you that if you're going to, put some spare money back in my pocket that uh, I never have a shortage of firearms. Okay. Um, but, but in preparation... Did I tell you I'm this, running for governor? Uh, I'm in the process of raising money to do that. So <laughs> I appreciate you bringing it up, Randy. The website is gregformontana.com. Uh, you take uh, PayPal, credit cards. Yeah, you can cash. do it right online. My <laughs> wife was with uh, uh, talking to a gentleman on the phone last week. He's a techie. You'd think he'd figure this out and... He, he's a friend of ours, but he, he made a silly statement. He says, I, I don't know how to support a candidate online. My wife said, well, <laughs> Craig, it's really easy. You just bring up the web page, you type in your visa number, you put in the amount, and you press enter. It's just like Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and did he, did he do it? I think he figured it out. Okay. Uh, and that, <clears throat> that's an important point. I mean, we've been, uh, we've been getting support from across the state. It's been really encouraging. Uh, mm-hmm. People want new leadership in Montana. Uh, we we uh, we did outraise the current governor by 43 percent in Q4 uh, because there seems to be a bubble around Helena. They, don't, they just don't get out much. And uh, uh, I just finished a tour, Ekalaka to Eureka last week. 50 town hall meetings for for people who don't aren't familiar with Montana geography. Eureka is down in where Montana, South Dakota, and Wyoming come together. Or, or Ekalaka. Yeah. And Eureka is up almost on the British Columbia border up in far northwest Montana. And there's not a straight interstate that goes there. Well, we started in Bozeman, drove, it was uh, Billings, Hardin, Forsyth, Mile City, Broadus, and then Ekalaka, Baker, Weebo, Scobie, Plenty Wood, Culbertson, Wolf Point, all the way across. And it was, by the time we got back home, it was 3,000 miles we'd driven. We'd never left the state. Yeah. You, you know what you just listed off there, Greg, is like every bird hunter's dream. <laughs> Let's go get some turkeys and some pheasants and some waterfowl. And, I mean, that loop you just mentioned? Yeah, that's you, it. You, you, you could wear out three sets of dogs on a trip no like problem. that in no October. Problem. And, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, Montanans want to come home, and they do. Mm-hmm. But they need to be able to make a living. Yeah. And that's why we're doing this. The other cohort that we were able to hire from is in our business 
is people that have fallen in love with Montana and they've selected it as a destination. And, uh, you know, for those that kind of embrace the Montana lifestyle and, uh, you know, we got room here. Yeah. Well, what you said there strikes very true with me. If my wife is listening to this podcast, we came to Bozeman for our honeymoon because my wife is the world's greatest fishing nut. So we showed up here in 1989 and, uh, we were going to make a big tour of the West fishing. Mm -hmm. We didn't hardly get out of Bozeman. We spent most of the two weeks here. And as we were heading back home, we were living in Reno at the time. She looked at me and said, I'm moving here. You coming with? I'm like, honey, we just got married and you're already giving me the ultimatum here. So I can, I can relate to the people wanting to move I, to a place like this. If I were you, I'd like be this. pretty thankful. <clears throat> Oh, yeah. I'm, trust me. I, I married so far up the ladder, Greg. <laughs> I, I couldn't even see that wrong from where I started. But. So what, what's your <clears throat> next hunting or fishing trip? Uh, my next hunting or fishing trip, my, the, the one that's on the calendar for the TV show is I'm going to Alaska okay. for spring bear. It's, it's my annual kind of go and get away from the world. There, there's no cell coverage. There's no anything. It's just out on an island in the Tongass National Forest. Oh, good. Me and the bears. and so. Yeah, good. <clears throat> but when I get back from that, my wife already has the summer calendar filled in. Walleye fishing, walleye fishing, walleye fishing. Because she, she used to think trout fishing was okay until I took her back home to Minnesota and she ate walleyes. And anyone who fishes knows that yeah. walleyes are a remarkable table fare. And she's this very pragmatic, practical woman who says, if you hook them, you cook them. That, that, that's her... Her well, my, my one fishing trip of the year where I keep fish, I do an ice out trip every spring up on the Rocky Mountain front. And uh, it's sort of like the freshwater version of bone fishing. You know, they're <laughs> these big hogs, rainbows, you know, they're sort of three to eight pounds up in the shallows. Yeah. You cast to them by sight with leech patterns. And you're usually in knee deep water, casting into ankle deep water. And we camp out there on various lakes. And so I'll, yeah. we'll... Uh, We'll beautiful, do that in April. Beautiful. Place I've done it every there. year for 15 years. And, yeah. and the wind doesn't blow up there at all. Never notice it when you got an eight pound rainbow <laughs> on. <laughs> I was joking in that the Rocky Mountain front of Montana is known as one of the windiest places, but, <clears throat> but you got to have neoprene gloves and everything else. Otherwise, yeah. you just freeze to death. Yeah. So I was starting down the path about <clears throat> how many firearms I own, and we ended up trout fishing on the rocky mountain front so I'll, I'll try to get us back on the rail of of my firearm problem um in preparation for for this discussion i went and did an inventory of of my uh safe over the weekend i had 26 long guns shotguns and rifles and i didn't count all the live rounds of ammunition i got to 5,000 between my safe and and my storage room and i said now oh, that's enough i think the point would be made and uh, throughout the West, let's face it, firearm ownership is a big thing. Yeah, not just Montana. I'm talking everywhere. Um, and it's not a qu question of if you're going to own a gun. It's a question of how many and where you get in your ammo these days because it's hard to find. So you got any thoughts, ideas, concerns, worries on gun you ownership? You want me to give away my ammo shop? location no I, i'm not asking for any of that but uh i mean, I mean well it's, i think it's, it's a it's a question that any person running for an office in the west yes. has to talk about yeah so i'm a lifetime member of the nra uh i've i'm a clearly a gun owner because i'm a sportsman but our second amendment isn't about hunting right it's about personal defense and uh, i think our second amendment is very clear it says shall not be infringed and uh in this last uh, year. I mean, I, this is a question you should ask the current sitting governor here in Montana. Our House and our Senate passed bills that would have uh, expanded concealed carry in Montana and would have uh, uh, pushed back against the whole Obama gun grab. Uh, the House passed it. The Senate passed it. Uh, governor Bullock vetoed both those bills. So he is no friend of gun owners. And I, I, I know when I am Governor, I will defend our Second Amendment rights. Well, I'm there's in my house. We, you know, I, I remember Charlton Heston standing up at the NRA show. I go to the NRA conventions every year, and what, he's had my cold dead hands, and he's holding this. Yeah. 
Well, uh, rifle, I, I don't, but, I'm not sure I can compete with you on total inventory of long guns, but <laughs> I have my selection of shotguns. I typically hunt with a 300 Win Mag, and, of course, I have some uh, uh, Model 7 Remington in 243 that I'm waiting for grandchildren to there use. There you go. <laughs> uh, and my 27, you know, and a bunch bunch of guns. But And uh, for uh, – uh, I do also have uh, – we did – suppressors became – legal in Montana for big game hunting last year. So yep. I ordered one last May almost as soon as I could. I still don't have possession of it yet because uh, the Form 4, it's sitting over at Bob Ward's, and I'm waiting for the Form 4 to get processed. I was on the radio actually up in Great Falls, and they asked me in December what I wanted for Christmas. And I said, I want my Form 4 processed so I can get my <laughs> suppressor. Um, uh, Santa did not come through because the federal government is not that reliable, really. That, to me, <clears throat> seems like an infringement. Um and uh, I'm not sure there's much the state can do about that. Yeah. But at, when I became Santa uh, this past Christmas for my uh, second son, uh, he's a he's a competitive handgun shooter, and uh, but his Christmas gift from me was a golf ball launcher for his AR-15, which <laughs> is kind of a cool device. You I'm unscrew not that. you unscrew the muzzle brake and you screw on this. It looks like a suppressor. It's about an eight inch tube, and uh, you shoot blanks. And you put a golf ball in there. And uh, I'm thinking the the Governor's Cup is the big golf tournament mm-hmm. that is, it's governors plural, right? So yeah. uh, most, a lot of business people, uh, legislators play in it every year. I'm thinking I might use an AR-15 instead of a driver. <laughs> <laughs> but then you won't have any excuse if you have a slice or a hook. No, it, the problem is this little tube is not rifled. Oh. So you do get quite a slice <laughs> off of this thing, and it's not predictable. We, When we first got it, we put right, a, right here we put a trash can out the back and off the back porch here where we were shooting golf balls trying to hit the trash can, and w- it was not that effective. But you can get two or 300 yards out of a golf ball out of an AR-15. <laughs> If anyone would have told me this podcast would have been talking about shooting golf balls out of an AR-15, I couldn't have guessed that one. But uh, <clears throat> but uh, the point I was making with the cold dead hands thing is at my house, my wife and I, when something super important to us anymore, we say cold dead hands. Mm-hmm. And uh, for me, there's two two things that are cold dead hands, and it is my firearms and it's my public lands. Mm-hmm. And as as long as I have breath in my body, uh, and I'm a, and I can be an annoyance to anybody who's trying to do something to to take those guns or or public lands, um, it, it will be a cold dead hands issue for me. Well, we all need uh, to stand up because all of our rights are under attack. Yeah. So <clears throat> the uh, we're getting close to the end here. Mm-hmm. I, uh, but you're going to have to tell a couple more hunting stories before it's done, or fishing stories, which, whichever you would prefer. Well, the one that uh, the one that comes to mind, it was probably the most enjoyable for me, was uh, this. I showed you on the wall here this article from American Hunter magazine, yeah. and um, when my son came of age, did hunter safety as, at 12. Uh, I like to hunt spring bear, and uh, we we uh, snuck up on this. It was just a awful stench. It was in the spring and turned out to be a winter kill moose carcass and this bear was feasting on this thing and it was just putrid and it just stench was everywhere but its head was inside the carcass so it was in an area south of bozeman here where there are both grizzlies and black bears yep. and of course you you can shoot one and not the other in fact <laughs> you go turn in your hunting license if you shoot the latter right and so uh we were smart enough we waited and uh the uh uh we were waiting for this bear to show himself, and he finally picked up his head. And somehow, with that putrid stuff all over his head, he still winded us and turned his head. And I immediately knew black bear, but he was gone. And we spent the next year during the seasons that were open looking for this bear. We saw him again and uh, tried to make an approach. Now my son was 13, and we, we, missed, we missed that opportunity. Uh, and we came back two nights later. He was feeding in a high park, south-facing park, where they typically are in the spring, yeah. uh, these grass parks. And and he got a shot, and he, he, he was able to uh, harvest this bear. And it turned out to be a monster. It was a six-foot-six six bear. And I wrote That's that story big. up. And it's like, you know, it's all downhill from there for right. a young hunter. <laughs> and uh, the, I, the hide was in great shape, the, fur, the, the you know, the fur. But 
we uh, uh, funny part of the story. You know, this is kind of a little just redneck, but we went back and got a wheelbarrow, and we were able to go up <laughs> into the national forest and wheelbarrow the thing out. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's that's getting redneck, but my, that would be exactly how my dad would have done it. Like, it's it's those kind of things though that are so fun about living in a hunting culture in a in a place like we do in the West that you can go and do those things they become your lifelong family yeah. memories for for me they are sure. and and it's a huge part of of I guess who I am and what I'm about and mm-hmm. talking to you Greg it's uh it's quite apparent that you you hunt a lot if 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 you were to go to that freezer where you said had eight different uh, types of, of meat, uh-huh. what would be your preferred, yeah. if, if it was just you were cooking for yourself, you weren't cooking for guests, you weren't cooking yeah. for family. I think of all the animals, I think the, the moose I shot up in the Spanish Peaks was the best meat we've ever had. Okay, uh, I, I love moose. I mean, elk is a close second. Yeah. Um, we used to trade, we have a little bit of alfalfa here, we used to trade our neighbor he had a herd of 60 buffalo, and that wasn't a, a hunt yeah. deal, but uh, bison's up there pretty high, too. Yeah. Um, we love antelope. We kind of love it all. Yeah. You know, and we yeah. make our all our own sausage here at home. And, yeah. And, uh, well, I'm, you're not going to get argument from me on any of those that you mentioned. Uh, people know that I've, I've got this weird problem about pronghorn. I don't know what it is that I chase them anywhere I can go. Mm-hmm. And my only regret about pronghorn is they aren't 500 pounds like an elk. <laughs> because when you shoot one, if I shoot one in October, it's gone by Christmas. Yeah. I, I either need to find a place where there's more of them or they get bigger. Because I love to eat them. Well, and you probably I, just need to shoot more of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got my vote on that one. Oh, uh, well, I <clears throat> I think we're getting close to my last question, and then I'm just going to let you talk about anything you want to talk about okay. when, when we're done. But the, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1842, the Martin versus Waddell case, said that wildlife in the United States is held in trust under what they call the public trust doctrine, and that it's held in trust for the benefit of the citizens of that state, not, not the citizens of the country, but of that state. Um, and the court recognized that the trustees of that trust are the elected officials, the agency appointees and, and such. Um, if you're governor, you're going to be one of the most powerful trustees of this wildlife resource. Um, anything that you want to tell people of, Hey, if I am your trustee of these wildlife resources, here's what you can expect from me. Well, I think we've. We've, I think we've talked about a lot of Randy. I mean, I, I take that responsibility very seriously. I, I've, uh, uh, I'm a sportsman myself. I trap, I fish, I hunt. Um, it's uh, a lot of the food that goes on our table is stuff I've harvested on, and, and much of it on public land, some on private land too. I think the, the, we have to recognize that this resource that's held in trust uh, lives both on public land and private land. And... Uh, Again, I think that, that that stewardship, as governor, the primary lever I can pull is in selecting leadership for FWP and then working with the legislature to make sure we have uh, legislation that preserves our access uh, and, and brings science back into the process because it, we've gotten these uh, extremists who are more ideological than they are common sense. Uh, we've got to balance sportsmen's interests with uh, the re- managing the resource and with private property interests. Um, so I, my commitment to everybody is uh, I bring to the table my own experience being a hunter and a sportsman and enjoying public land. It's why I'm here in Montana. It's where I want to raise my family, and I did it on public land. And, uh, you know, I, I, take if, uh, uh, I take that responsibility very seriously. Yeah. Well, that's good to hear. So if you're elected governor, how much hunting are you going to get to do? You know, I'm actually thinking I might have, like, incredible hunting access. <laughs> so are you, you, you going to have, like, the governor's cup of pheasant hunting? or a Why gov- not? A governor's cup sporting clays tournament? Or something well, or? you know, I, uh, I, I believe, and people have heard me say this many times, the, I think the purpose of work is to serve other people. 
And I personally love to work. You know, I find it deeply satisfying and very rewarding. Uh, we've been incredibly blessed, uh, my wife and I, with the success we've enjoyed. And we feel a deep, deep obligation to Montana to give back and to serve. And, uh, it, you know, just as you said, if you don't show up for the hearing, you don't really have grounds to complain. Yeah. Well, I've been gifted with leadership skills. We've shown that we can make things happen that people thought were impossible. I think common sense and elbow grease is at the heart of getting anything done, really. And if Montanans will have us, we'll serve up in Helena. And uh, hopefully I can carve out some time for hunting. Well, I I hope that if, if you are elected that you do not let your hunting passions uh, get the one, I've got by... I've got nine days in on wolf so far, and I can't. Yeah. I can't say I've actually connected with one yet. You but. know, <clears throat> we filmed the first wolf hunt in the lower 48. And if you want to get a lot of hate mail, televise the first wolf hunt in the lower 48. I I think I'd la I quit counting after that aired. I quit counting at four. If you want to film another one, uh -huh. I would be happy to be on the show with okay. you. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I, I quit counting at 400 death wishes. Yeah. It, wow. it, and so people are asking, Randy, why don't you do these? But they weren't coming from Montana. No. What happened is the Center for Biological Diversity, one of these groups in Tucson, Arizona, that they got mad at me because I called some of them screwballs and wingnuts. Well, they sell, their behavior self-identifies that they are screwballs and wingnuts when they're willing to wish death upon somebody for doing a legal activity. I'm like, hmm. But anyhow... Uh, that's a tangent, but the because of that episode, I get tagged as the wolf guy in the outdoor TV world because we're the ones who who did it, and I was involved in the wolf politics here since '95, and and uh, so people will ask me, "Well, let's go and shoot a wolf." I'm like, "You don't understand. It takes me 20 days in the hills to have an encounter on, on average, and even because you get an encounter, doesn't mean that you get a shot." So anyone who takes on the task of wolf hunting mm -hmm. better not be someone who gives up easily. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you this, better, they better be really lucky. The closest <laughs> encounter I had was just south of Bozeman here. And I got, I cut a track at like first light on top of a ridge. And I spent five and a half hours walking that track down. And it was less than 24 hours old when I cut it. And when I got done, it was less than two hours old. But it was really cool to see. And this is why I love hunting different species so much is it. This wolf had been working on a side hill, a timbered side hill, and it was hunting deer. And there were two of them in, the, in this little pack. And they'd go, they'd zigzag back and forth on the finger ridges going down the side of this thing. They'd get to the bottom, they'd run up the valley about a quarter, half mile, and then they'd zigzag up. And they did that up and down. I think I climbed well over 4,000 <laughs> feet that day. And, and the reason I ended up throwing in the towel was I was just out of gas, you know. And, but... It was one of the most awesome days I've ever had in the woods. I never actually saw the wolf, but uh, I was there with those two wolves all day long. Yeah. Well, I, th I think a lot of us can relate to certain experiences. And, and even when we're out there, how many times do we just look around and say, wow, how cool is this? Mm -hmm. Who, how did I luck out to get to be here doing this at this point in time? And it's those experiences that I think bring out so much passion about these issues. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's that that's the response to well, it. Well, it's a so. key element of our way of life. Yeah. And we need to preserve it. Well, I don't know that I could come up with a better closing line than that, Greg. So unless you have a lot more you want to talk about, I, I suspect, is, is there like guests waiting out the door here? Like when you're running for governor, do you have like a schedule of just people? Oh, this is my first day here at home in two weeks. Really? Because, <laughs> as I said, we've been traveling the state. Oh, and uh, I was in Haver last night, and I'll be someplace else tomorrow. And, 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 it, and you know, I again, I like work. Yeah. I enjoy being hooked to the plow. It's I find work for a noble purpose uh, deeply satisfying, yeah. and I, I enjoy it. Well, thanks for your time. Thanks so much. I greatly appreciate it, and best of luck in November. Thank you, Randy.